hey, what is it for you? Um, where is it for you? Uh, a place that you like to visit, maybe a place that you go to in your memory where you feel a sense of respite, um, rest, warmth, affection, a place where you make meaningful memories. Could be for you, it could be a vacation that you take annually to go to a place. It could be an annual trip that you took growing up for the holidays. Um, it could be a, a hiking trip or, or a fishing excursion that you go on. What is it for you? Is there anything like that in your life that is a, a quiet place that you've frequented and you really like? You know, I always cherish the road trips growing up. One of the things that we did back before Child Protective Services was on everyone's phone. Um, <laughs> is we had this Chevy Astro van. Anybody know the Chevy Astro? Amazing van. Don't get in an accident in one of those. But anyways, um, we would go on these road trips and, and my parents would take the middle seat out of the van, put a rug down, uh, plug one of those AC adapters in, and this little TV, little box TV, and we would hook up our Nintendo 64, and we would treat on the highway sorry mom and dad, our van as a living room. My brother and I would sit on the rug on the floor and play video games like we were sitting in a living room while we're driving at 75 miles per hour <laughs> down the highway. And one of the places that we, we went to every year was Texas. And I remember Texas like it was yesterday. We would go down to Cousin's Land and we would tend to and ride horses. Um, we would learn to steer the lawnmower across the acreage and there was a, a huge wood, you know, natural fireplace that you had to stoke and the whole time we were there, we all just smelled like that. Uh, we played cops and robbers, you know, late into the night. We would all laugh every year at Jim Carrey's rendition of The Grinch. We would watch that together. Uh, I remember sitting in the back of a car every time we would go and I have all older cousins, right? So I'm the younger one, and um, I would get away with listening to Jay-Z and Linkin Park, and you know, without my parents knowing, and I'm with my cousins, right? So I remember seeing The Fellowship of the Ring for the first time, a Lord of the Rings movie, and not caring for it at all. It would be my love for that that would grow later on. What is it for you? Like, if you just stop and you think about a place that evokes a sense of home and care and it's just meaningful a place that gives you comfort and love a place with memories that you'll always be thankful for and a place with people that you'll always cherish city light it's uh it's no stretch for me to let you know that that place for much of my life has been the church um there's nothing like the church I love the church, hopefully, I'm a pastor. I, I am, I'm indebted to the church for so much in my life. It was a local church through which my friendships that I treasure, many of whom I'm still friends with today, they were formed. It was a local church that I was taught and counseled through the word of God. I learned to memorize scripture. I learned where all the books of the Bible are. It was a local church that I learned about the person and work of salvation in Jesus Christ. It was a local church uh, with whom my parents kind of partnered with other parents. You know, it takes a village to, to, to mentor and disciple the next generation. It was a local church that taught me how to be a servant and, you know, travel to Louisiana after Katrina and roll up my sleeves as a high school student and, and serve and to go down to Texas and places that were homeless and minister to, to drug addicted people. It, it was a local church that I just could list off so many exhaustive things that I'm thankful for. Um, it was a local church that financially supported a college ministry through which I really started following Jesus my, my junior year of, of college. When I understood him as, as Lord, I um, really began to make decisions with my public life that honored him. And it was always a local church. And I know that's not everyone's story. We've got 
newcomers in here. We've got people who haven't grown up in the church. We've got people who have had really bad experiences in the church, and now, you know, you're trying it again, and everybody comes from, from different places, but uh, I love the church. I, just to let you into my story even more, I, I've been uh, in a small church surrounded by cornfields. I've belonged to a truck stop church off of a, a highway. Um, I've belonged to a, a, a downtown church in a crime-ridden area of Kansas City. I've belonged to a mega church in the middle of a big city. And I wonder, when you think of the church, not the big C, universal, all the believers across the globe at all times and all places, but the little C, local, visible body of Christ, do you feel the same way that you do about a, a, a place that you long to go to? Do you feel a sense of fondness when you think about your church? Do you feel a sense of, of affection and, and, and the same warmth? Do you feel the same way? Why do I ask this? I ask this because one week from today, we're going to be in a totally new place. We're going to be at Westview High School, and for anybody who's familiar with kind of the story behind that, uh, basically it's providing for us some, some really great things that are going to help our church on Sundays. Um, we're excited to make the move. It, it puts us in an area where we get more exposure. It puts us in an area that literally is right next to a YMCA, as Roy said, and uh, half of our church already works out there. Perfect. Come to church on Sunday. Um, I, I believe and have faith that our church is going to grow when we enter into this next chapter. But we're going to do a standalone sermon this morning that's not in the book of Genesis. Sorry to let you down. What we're going to do this morning is we're going to all together, we're going to evaluate our attitude toward the local church. What do we think of her? How do we think of her? It's easy to allow our, our warmth toward the church to fade, is it not? We can be honest. It's easy to allow our excitement about the church and what God's doing to decline. It's all too easy to allow our service to the church to, to disappear for certain seasons and we grow cold and apathetic. Let's, let's, let's get honest here. Um, the church can become, in our minds, quite unremarkable, can it not? Yeah. Uh, week after week, we have a regular gathering of ordinary men and women committed to a largely invisible mission. We're young and old, and we're male and female, and we're single and married, and we've got unemployed people, and we've got um, workaholics, and we've got uh, low income, high income, and uh, we all sing off key. Believe me, I have stood next to many of you. Uh, like Kevin said, it's a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Uh, we can be distracted. Like right now, I'm probably up here talking and you're distracted. We can be hurried. We can be rushed. We can come in here and just want to get it done and then, you know, be gone. And believe me, I know I talk to a lot of you. It's one of your pastors and Oftentimes we can't even, when we start to get into to the, the depths of ministry with one another, we sometimes don't even know how to articulate like our own faith. We just know we believe it. Like, uh, how do we tell someone the gospel? How do we explain the Trinity? How do we talk to people about uh, atonement and justification and sanctification and all these theological words? And we know it's there. We know we have faith in it. We know we believe it, but we don't quite know how to, how to say it. And so it can be kind of, of messy. There's a diversity of uh, personalities in the room, okay? There's a diversity of convictions culturally in the room. There's a diverse, diversity of senses of humor and, and sense of fashion. Um, there's a diversity of, of sports fandom in the room. There's a diversity of parenting styles and convictions in the room. I could go on and on and on. We're not seamlessly, like, harmonized all the time, okay? We're just not. We're just going to be honest, this is the church. Like we set up and we tear down the same things every single week. We have the same donuts and the same coffee every single week. We, you know, come in here and we open up the Bible and we teach and we sing and we pray and we teach our kids about Jesus and we go home every single week on repeat forever. To my own neighbors, whom I love, they're content to hear stories of 
God's grace in our church, and they're glad that the church that I pastor isn't a failure. Good for Glenn, they think. Um, But it's not impressive. It's not compelling. It's ordinary. It's predictable like any other church in Omaha. Just last week, I was having a conversation with a younger brother in the faith who's frustrated because Protestants or or non-Catholics make it seem, in his mind, like there's 6,000 different ways to properly be a Christian, and he just doesn't want to commit to a church. Like, y'all, there's no shortage right now of narratives of people who are are deconstructing from the faith and and finding their way out of the church and rejecting the church. And I I just finished watching The Secrets of Hillsong. And and it's heartbreaking, the the scandal of the church. And, you know, you get on YouTube or social media or, or, you know, TikTok and You'll find that, that, that leaving the church is like the, the spiritually mature thing to, to do. It's the thing that gives us uh, real spiritual and, uh, you know, maturity and, and, uh, and credibility. If we're not asking this question, now is the time to ask, why should we care about the church? Why should we love the church? What should we think about the church, why should we be invested to this? Why should we give toward this? Why should we care? The answer requires us this morning, this one time, to look beyond our own church preferences and our church opinions and beyond our own church history, uh, beyond our own church experiences, beyond our, our church hurts, beyond our church wounds, and it requires us to look past all of that and to come before God himself and to say, God, what do you think of the church? What do you think of the church? Your view, your opinion matters. Ours doesn't. Here's the goal for this morning. It's for us to understand, City Light, that God so loves, loves the church. God loves the church so much. The church is the sphere where all of God's presence and all of God's power and his promises and his gifts and and miracles and purposes are all shown and all realized This is the church, and Martin Lloyd-Jones, if any of you know him, an old author, pastor, this is what he says. He says, our greatest need is to recapture the New Testament teaching concerning the church. If only we could see ourselves in terms of it, we would realize that we are the most privileged people on earth. There is nothing to be compared with being a Christian and a member of the body of Christ. So here's where we're going. I want to walk us through this morning a few different portraits of the church in our Bibles. And, and we're going to jump all over the place, so I won't invite you to turn anywhere necessarily. Here's what we're going to do along the way. Um, I don't want us to ask, what do we think of the church? I don't want us to ask, what do we think of City Light Bennington? I want us to ask, God, what do you think of the church? Have I understood the church like you do? Do I treat the church like you would have me? Have I participated in the church in this way? Here's our responsibility before we transition to a new place with, with, with new exposure and, and new opportunities and new provision from God. Here's our responsibility this morning. This is our task, church. Here's our task. See the church as God does. Love the church as God does. Here's my big idea, my big application. Love this church. Love this church. And as we work through this, you're going to see why I would say that. Um, Let me pray, and we're going to ask for God to speak to us and teach us. And man, he's going to answer it this morning. Let's pray. God, we simply ask right now, you would make the soil of our hearts fresh for tilling, uproot things in us, change us, transform us. God, help us. Your word is a lamp to our feet. It's a light to our path. 
Use it this morning, Holy Spirit, to teach us, to rebuke us, to correct us, to train us, to make us whole. Holy Spirit, have your way among us. Be our teacher, in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, <laughs> when a person becomes a Christian, when they bow their knee to Jesus and, and they pledge their life to him and they ask him for forgiveness of their sin, something happens that we should probably talk about more, and that something is adoption into the family of God. You know, it happens to be Father's Day today. Um, I know that I am so grateful for a dad who was an answer to a lot of what Roy prayed earlier. It's a great model to me, provided, protected, taught me so much about God and about Jesus. And yet I recognize that there are many of us who are either fatherless or there are those of us who have had really bad experiences with their fathers. When a person pledges their life to Jesus and they become a Christian, they are born again. And here's the truth. God becomes our father. He is a perfect, unfailing, heavenly father. We know him as father. You know, the old, the old Baptists, when I was growing up, would always call everybody brother and sister. You guys remember that? Like, you come up to somebody and they're like, hey, brother, brother Jeff, how you doing? You know, and, you know, the pastor would be like, we're going to have bro- brother Gene come up and pray for us now. And uh, sister Eileen is going to come. And here's my, here's my ask. Let's bring it back. For real. It's time to bring it back. Let's normalize calling each other brother and sister in Christ. I did not think that was going to get a good reaction. It's amazing. You're excited just like I am. I love calling many of you brother and sister. Why? Because it's who you are. I love it when you call me brother because that's who I am. In John 1.12, it says, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, this is Jesus, he gave the right to become children of God. Oh, that we would know God as Father, that we would know God as a loving Father. It all starts with that relationship, the relationship of a loving Father to his child. And throughout the New Testament, all of God's one another verses, of which there are over 50, all of them, are just the blueprint for our family life. Church, number one in understanding the church is that we are a family. We really are actually a family. Um, Build one another up. Show honor to one another. Love one another with brotherly affection. Admonish one another. Speak the truth in love to one another. Sing with one another. Instruct one another. Care for one another. Bear one another's burdens. Forgive one another. Do good to one another. Be kind to one another. Stir up one another to love and good works. Don't speak evil against each other. Don't lie to one another. Don't grumble against one another. Don't show partiality or favoritism to one another. We keep moving toward one another because that's what family does. We keep drawing close to one another. This is our way of life. These are our family traits. This is how people know our Father's DNA is in us. It's how we treat one another. Megan Hill, whose voice is going to echo from time to time through this sermon, she wrote a book that I, I love. I would recommend it to anybody. It's called A Place to Belong. And it's a book that just teaches you about how to love the local church. It's a book that refreshed me as a pastor. Here's what she writes. The church is not a man-made society that we can participate in or opt out of according to our own level of comfort. The PTA, the Neighborhood Association, the Library Booster Club do not obligate us to personal sacrifice when things get tough. Family does. Because God's people are our family, we will hold our preferences and, and our priorities loosely We will open our hearts, we'll open our doors, we will pull up another chair to the dinner table, and we'll put another name on our prayer list. We will give people groceries and furniture and smiles. We will share their grief and trials and disappointments. We will look for ways to show love. And don't miss this. As a result, child of God, as a result, we will expect to have less money and less free time than we would have on our own. We will expect to have added sorrow. 
we will also expect to have added joy. There's nothing like being a part of the church. Many of you have benefited so much from family in the church. Church, we should expect an increase of our obligations and a decrease of our independence, and this is for our good, and it's for God's glory. No other community on earth should capture belonging like the church does. No other community on earth can so transcend the natural and material and bind us together at a cosmic, eternal level like the church does. If this is a little difficult for you, <laughs> or you've never known church like this, or you don't really want to live out church like this, I want you to consider Hebrews 2.11. Here's what it says. For he, Jesus, who sanctifies or makes holy, and those who are sanctified all have one source. That's God the Father. That is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. Let me just boil that down for you. This is saying Jesus is the firstborn. When he rose from the grave, he demonstrated to the whole world the new kind of human being that he can empower all of us to be. We're the first, he's the first fruits. He, he shows and, and, and his life on earth showed us what is possible for us as believers with his spirit residing in us. And we, we have the same source that he did, the Father. We have the same Father. So here's what it's saying. It's saying that if Jesus isn't ashamed to treat us as his brothers and his sisters, why would we ever be ashamed to treat one another as such? If Jesus, holy, holy, all majesty, all glory, so utterly different from us, would look at us as brothers and sisters, call us that with pride, would we not do that with one another? So City Light, let's live into who we already are. Okay, we're not like striving to see if we can like be family. We are family. In Jesus' name, we're family. If you've bowed your knee to Jesus, you are a Christian. You've been born again. You are family. So be in fellowship. Like build relationships, care for people, practice the one another's. Why? Why? Because this is what God sees and this is what God loves. And this is a beautiful picture to a watching world. The application can be a million different things. My hope and my prayer is that you would just exercise one. What does it look like to that much more when we're at Westview? Live as family than maybe we have so far. Number two, we are a body. We're a body. In Colossians 1.18, it says, he, Jesus, is the head of the body, the church. Um, there is nothing like witnessing a baptism. Would you agree? Uh, it's one of our favorite things in church life. We pull out the little, you know, tiny hot tub thing that we have that no person can really fit in. Or if you're Jared Weineman, we pull out a thing in like the freezing cold weather outside and just dunk you. So um, when someone gets baptized, we are always celebrating and we're always thankful and we're always excited about how they've been reconciled to God how their sin has been forgiven by God, how they get to enter into ongoing interactive relationship with God, how the vertical channel there that's just been blocked and corrupted by sin is now clear. They can know God as Father. But you know what we don't talk about nearly as much that is just as important? What we don't often address that is just as true is when a person is baptized, they are baptized into the body of Christ. They, they're actually baptized into a oneness with everyone else. One spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And to be in the body of Christ, there's nothing that compares. 1 Corinthians 12, 12, for just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. We are one. When we suffer, when one person among us suffers, we all feel that suffering. That's right. When one person among us is celebrating and thriving and rejoicing and has good news, we celebrate and we thrive and we rejoice and we fan into flame those gifts. When one person among us isn't serving, we all feel that. When people in our church are serving and saying, let's go, we all feel that. Bennington Days was an incredible example of this. We got up here and we said, hey, we need the body of Christ to mobilize. 
And in like one announcement, 70 people said, I'll go. I'll man the, the uh, whatever they're called, bounce houses, and I'll, 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 I'll tally in the, in the gospel tent how many kids are here in the gospel, and I'll, I'll serve up snow cones and whatever it looks like. God has so designed it that all of us are needed. Not only that, but think about this practically. This oneness is happening all around us every time we are just in proximity with one another. I want you to think about when you come to a Sunday gathering and uh, you're hanging out, maybe you get here a little bit early, you hang out beforehand, the five of you that do that, everyone else is 15 after. Um, And then there's some of you who hang out afterwards, right, and you're lingering and you're talking, maybe you show up to a city group and there's that first half hour where everyone's catching up and asking what's going on in each other's life. And then there's the the people that kind of linger after because maybe there's some stuff going on. In all those little moments, we are living out and making visible the interdependent body of Christ. Things are happening in those little moments where people have needs that are being met. Uh, Things are happening where a meal train is getting set up. Things are happening where someone is putting their hand on somebody else and praying for them right then, right there. And here's the thing. Uh, In in, uh, Scripture, your spiritual gifts are, are not best expressed individually. They are best expressed in the context of the local church. The church is God's design for where you exercise the skills and the talents and the abilities and the strengths that God has given you. In 1 Corinthians 12, 18, it says, but as it is, God arranged the members in the body. Let me pause. God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. What would be so heartbreaking is a church with several limbs and organs that are dead. <laughs> you can't function. Uh, a lot of churches, the, the classic, like, you know, 20% of people do 80% of the work, blah, 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 blah. Churches will just live on that. I'm dreaming. I'm dreaming. I'm dreaming. And I've dreamt since, since day one that we would be a church where leaders aren't begging for people to be a part of the body. That we'd be a church where people are saying, I want to do whatever it takes to identify needs in the church, gaps in the church, spiritual giftings that I have, and I just want to take steps of faith. I want to I breathe wind and life into my local church. Um, in Romans 12, 6, it says, having gifts that differ according to the grace given us, here's the commandment. Let us use them. Let us use them. Separated from the body, our spiritual gifts can be very hindered. In the local church is where they find their proper expression. So City Light, let's live into who we already are. We don't have to work to become a body. We're already the body of Christ who left physically but dwells in us spiritually. We are his representation on earth. Every member of every capacity is needed. Here's my challenge. Serve. Contribute. Make investments. Be an owner rather than a renter. Look for gaps. Look for needs. Raise your hand. Take initiative. Why not? Why not? It's so worth it. And I'm not saying that as somebody who planted the church and, you know, has my name on the church. And I'm saying that as a Christian brother of yours. Like, why not? Don't do the bare minimum. I'm going to... I'm going to ruffle some feathers real quick, okay? I'm going to, what, what's the thing that preachers say sometimes? I'm going to, I'm going to menace for a second or something like that. Um, some of you, you're serving once a month, and I say, thank you. Would you consider twice? Would you consider serving instead of 12 hours a year? 24 hours a year, you know? Um, for some of you, you, you haven't served in our church in any formal capacity yet. I'm not here to shame you. I'm here to say we need you. Like genuinely, we need you. You have no idea sometimes what's going on behind the scenes and the kind of need we have and the prayers we're praying for God to raise up laborers. People who will say yes in a volunteer capacity. I'll jump in, I'll help, I'll serve. Have you been blessed by City Light Bennington? Have you experienced fellowship and, 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 and unity here? Have you, been, have you been ministered to here? What's your next step? I'm just asking, take initiative and, and serve. Go back today today like now's not the time to shrink back when we're going to a new place now's the time to step in go back to the get connected table afterwards and just fill out something and tell us i want to serve we'll help you find your spot you don't have to sign a contract to serve somewhere it's not a it's not a limitless commitment you're making 
Um, if you don't like it, you could switch to another team. I mean, just, we're saying, let's be that church. Let's actually be the body of Christ. Um, if you've been in a city group and you've been blessed by, by the fellowship of a city group and you've been in that group for a while, what if God's calling you to be a city group leader, to open up your home, to open up your Bible, to pray for people? You can get qualified to do that. You can minister to real people who have needs. They're going to march into our church, brand new families. And they're going to say, oh, we want to be in a group. And, and Do any of us want to be a church? This is, we don't really have a group for you right now. Come on. We need the people of God to be the body of Christ. God, let it be. Let it be. Number three. Okay, we're a family. We're a body. Number three, City Light, we're a house. We're a house. I want to read this to you. Um, Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 22, it says, uh, But you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Any questions? I'm just kidding. If you belong to Christ, here's what that is saying. You don't just have a seat like your fold-down cushy seat at Westview when we get there, right? You have a seat in heaven. When people gather to praise God, he inhabits that praise. Um, Worshiping with the church brings us to heaven on earth, to heaven itself. Uh, The church is like an embassy, that represents a a foreign place, heaven, right in the middle of our community. Right Right here, this, right here in Anchor Point Elementary Gym is a a kingdom of God outpost, right here. Every time we come together, we're coming before God Almighty, God our provider, God our deliverer, God our healer, God, our sustainer, our friend, our good shepherd. God, our redeemer. And when we gather together and we worship him, he is there among us. He inhabits the praise of his people. We are citizens of heaven. We are citizens of his kingdom. Jesus is our king. He is here. He's in us. He's among us. When we gather at Westview, it's going to be an environment and a place where heaven meets earth. Come on. To walk in on a Sunday morning and to see people known and unknown and to worship King Jesus and to pray together. And like we're going to do later, take communion together. Nothing compares. And nothing is truer of our identity than we, we are in those moments. I think about, too, as a house, what kind of hospitality the people of God. In, in uh, Romans fifteen seven, Paul says, Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Hey, hey, everybody in the room, uh, front row, back row, where, whoever you are, how has Jesus welcomed you? How are you going out of your way to welcome others? The house of God on a Sunday morning should be the most doors open, arms open wide. Get in here. Let's call our church. Get in here, church. It should be a place where hospitality is exercised by everybody, not just the people on the hospitality team. Okay? See people. Move toward people. Get curious about people. Ask questions to people. Introverts, you can do it. You can do it. City Light, in light of this, here's here's my, my plea. Show up to church when you're happy and when you're sad. Show up to church when you are grieving 
and when you're rejoicing. Show up to church when you are suffering and tired and show up to church when things are going great. Don't retreat or forsake the assembly of God's people. Put yourself under his word with your people. Join your heart in the songs of your people. Tether your prayers to the prayers of your tribe, your people, as a citizen of heaven. Every Sunday we have this opportunity and get to make ourselves available to the Holy Spirit's power and his ministry and the manifestation of his gifts. This is the church. The house of God will put you closer to heaven than anything else can. You're not just an individual Christian with a quiet time. You're a family. You're part of a body. You belong to a house. Number four, we're a light. We're a light. Think about our name, City Light. It comes out of Matthew 5, 14 through 16. It says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a stand and it gives light to all in the house in the same way. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. What is this light that is shining? What is this? John eight twelve. Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness but will have the light of life. We are surrounded by darkness. This is the state of our world from Genesis chapter 3. There are forces at work that hate the church. There are forces at work that hate you, Christian, want to derail you, discourage you, lead you to despair cause you to move into full-on doubt. To be a light in our city is a significant thing. We're not a country club for Christians. Why do people go to church? Why would people show up to Westview High School on a Sunday morning? I want to... I want to tell you, I don't think it's because they've heard that me and Roy are just great preachers. I watched them online. They're awesome. I don't think it's because they watched our band and said, man, they know how to rock. Let's go to that church. I don't think it's because they see, like, you know, our, our logo and think, oh, great, good graphic design. We should go check out that church. Do you know why most people are probably going to show up to church? Because someone that they know is a Christian who loves Jesus and loves them. And there's a point in that relationship where an invitation from that person who's happy and glad in the Lord and at peace and who has hope and who can suffer well and who loves and trusts in Jesus says to them, come to church with me. And that person says, sure, why not? The prayers that happen at 8 a.m. on Sunday mornings are one of the greatest services that we give to our community. Because we're interceding and praying against the forces of darkness in the name of Jesus, who has all authority in heaven and on earth and under the earth. We are protecting and interceding and praying for and asking God to minister to our region. The church gets to do that. That's our privilege to do that. It's amazing. Um, I, I wanted to do this because... It's just, we haven't ever done this. This right here in my hand. This is our City Light Bennington Prospectus. Roy just sighed because he remembers the good old days. (laughs) We had this thing uh, printed out 2020 sometime, I think, when we were doing prayer gatherings and we were having people come in and saying, hey, this is who we want to be. We want you, you know, take this, flip through the pages, read about like our vision and you know, uh, one of the things I love about this is there's, there's a picture of Roy in here. Man, I, I should have had them put it up on the screen. He, he showed up to my house to take this picture and forgot we were taking pictures. So he had like this, this nasty raggedy t-shirt on. And he said, do you have anything I could, I could wear? So Roy, in, in the prospectus, is wearing like a skin tight. Guys, I'm not built like Roy, okay? Look at, 
So I, I'm like, yeah, bro, I got something for you. And he's wearing like this skin tight, you know, thing. And he looks great. But I mean, you can see every contour of that chest. I'm just saying. So here's, here's what it says. Here's what it says. In the United States, 85% of American churches are plateaued or in decline. 70 plus churches close each week. In Nebraska, from 2010 to 2020, our state's population is estimated to have grown by nearly 70,000. And from 2007 to 2014, so just preceding that, the percentage of Nebraskans participating in a church on any given weekend fell almost 10%. One in four Nebraskans identify as non-Christian or religiously unaffiliated. In Omaha, from 2010 to 2018, the population grew by 48K. And as the Omaha population approaches 1 million people, if every church in our city was filled to max capacity, we would still be reaching less than 25% of the population. In Bennington, 700% area growth in the last 20 years. School district enrollment projected to double in four years. Over 60% of households, probably more than that now, not involved in a church. Let me read to you on the very first page. It says a story is unfolding in Northwest Omaha. Listen to this. It's not a new story. In fact, it's been in motion for thousands of years and it centers on Jesus, the light of the world, saving people from their sin, redeeming their lives from darkness, and inviting them into an eternal spiritual family. Jesus wants relationship with us. He wants us to know his grace and respond with worship that is no longer misplaced. God is bringing about a future. You all paying attention? God's bringing about a future in which, Habakkuk 2.14, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. After his resurrection, Jesus commissioned us to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And by the power of this Spirit, God is gathering a group of Christians who are committed to not just attending a place with programs on a Sunday, but to being a people with a purpose. Questions. What would it look like if the poor were served, if the hurting were cared for, if the sleepy Christians woke up, if marriages and families found their strength and hope in Jesus? How could our city and region be changed if people oriented everything in their lives around the good news of the gospel? I ain't done. We dream of forming Jesus-centered people whose lives are saturated in the good news, forming spirit-led people who are filled and empowered and gifted by the Holy Spirit, A church that raises up and develops the next generation of laborers who will multiply disciples and churches. A northwest Omaha region known as a place where a movement of God is changing families from generation to generation. A church where Monday through Saturday is just as important as Sunday. Where ordinary men and women equipped to be missionaries in their neighborhoods. Where thousands of people are meeting Jesus through city groups and being baptized and joining the family of God. A coalition committed to a cause much greater than itself. City Light Bennington. I still dream of all those things. I dream of them more now than I did back then. I wonder if you've bought in to that dream. If being a part of this church, you've seen that dream begin to be realized. Philippians 2, 21, Paul says in in a condemning fashion, he says, for they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. Will we seek our own interests or will we seek the interests of Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Lord, through this local church? The church exists by mission, as a fire exists by burning. Did you hear that? The church exists by mission as a fire exists by burning. Mission is the very orientation of our church. We didn't start City Light Bennington to bring the kingdom of God here. 
We started City Light Bennington because the kingdom of God was already coming. Happened in a neighborhood. It's happening in multiple neighborhoods now. It's happening all over Northwest O. God, let us be a light. Here's my invitation. Make invitations for people to join us on Sundays. Start a huddle. Start a little Bible study with people in your neighborhood, people in your workplace. Make the sacrifice to get up early. Make the sacrifice to show up late. Whatever it looks like, to just get yourself with other human beings that are not involved in our church before the word of God and before the person of Jesus. He loves them so much. It costs him his life. Number five, and last, I promise, I know I'm taking a while, okay? We are beloved. I would say this, this is underneath and, and above and, and ahead and behind. This is, the th- this is the thing. We're beloved. More than 30 times in the New Testament, the church is called beloved. God loves his people because he loves his people. God's love isn't influenced by us. It's not bought by us. His love is not earned by us. It's not caused by us. He loves us because he loves us. And in the atoning work of Christ to pay the debt of our sin, we see the height, the depth, the width, the breadth of the love of God for us in Christ Jesus. God loved his people from all eternity. And he loved loved us all the way to the cross Having loved his owner in the world, he loved them to the end. Friends, right now, think about your story. Think about where you were. Think about the moments and the seasons when the love of God just gripped you. His love for you just put you in awe. It shocked you that God of all creation would be mindful of you and love you in the way that the scriptures tell us that he does. When the cross of Jesus was expanding in your heart and your realization of, of everything that it accomplished for you was growing. Have you had seasons like that? What does an increasing understanding of God's love for us do in our heart? What does an increasing love and understanding of God's love for us do in our heart? What does it do? It's quite simple. It grows us in our love for him. Welcome to the Christian faith. God first loved us, now we love him. That is the cornerstone of our life and our decisions and our values and our priorities. Jesus is our first love. Jesus is our all-consuming love. Jesus is our treasure. We wouldn't trade him for anything. Jesus is our portion. Jesus is our great reward. Jesus is life itself. And what does our great love love? The church. Jesus Loved the church and gave himself up for her. Jesus came for his church. That's the whole plan of redemption. It's about the beauty and the maturing of the bride of Christ. Of the family and the body and the light and the house and God's beloved people on into eternity. Beloved, if God so loved us, 1 John 4, 11, we also ought to love one another. John Stott once wrote, no one who has been to the cross and seen God's immeasurable and unmerited love displayed there, can go back to a life of selfishness. 1 John 3.16, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Christian, let me ask you a question. Do you want to grow? Do you want to grow in Christ? If you want to grow, I have your next step. Come to church and love the people you find there. With God's love. With a spirit-empowered love. You have everything you need to love the people of God. God, John 13, 35, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So what is it for you? That place that evokes joy and warmth and affection and meaningful memories. May we all, along with the hundreds of people who by God's grace join our church in the years to come, 
be able to say beyond a shadow of a doubt, it's the church. By faith in Jesus, these are my people. By faith in Jesus, this is my identity. By faith in Jesus, these are my family members. By faith in Jesus, this is the body that I belong to. By faith in Jesus, this is my mission. This is my place of comfort and care. This is my place of welcoming and belonging. This is my place of fun and laughter and joy and rest and security. And finally, in closing, by faith in Christ, it is my place of communion. This is my place of communion, my place of sharing in and participating in and identifying with the church, the sphere where all God's presence and his promises and and his, his power and his gifts and his miracles are all made visible. It's all made visible through the church. In 1 Corinthians 11, 24 through 25, here's what Paul writes. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Every time we partake in communion, if we're tempted to pride, communion shatters that. Because as we all eat and drink across this congregation, we remember that Christ had to suffer for us too. Every time we partake in communion and we're tempted to despair, we don't think that we can belong to God's people because of past sin, communion shatters that and gives us encouragement. There is nothing about your sin, my sin, that isn't also true of every other person in this room. We've fallen short of the glory of God. Jesus came to die for us in our place. We all gather in humility before a holy, holy, holy God. City Light, as we enter into a new chapter next week, may there be an ever-growing chorus of people who for the first time finally trust Jesus for the forgiveness of their sin and for new life and for eternity and for friendship with God. And may there be an ever-growing chorus in our region of people who will one day declare from Revelation 7.10, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Hallelujah. To the Lamb of God who takes away our sin. Love this church. Love this church. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for your great love for us. Demonstrated through the shedding of your blood, not for your sin, but for ours. God, humble us in your presence now as we partake. In Jesus' name, amen.